I regret that Dr. Randall cannot be with us this morning. She was stricken ill about nine o'clock this morning and is now in the doctor's care. So I will do the best I can to fill in. And uh, please understand that I do not wish Dr. Randall to be held responsible in any way for the remarks that I may make. I will do the best I can, however, to the subject which she chose for her lecture, which has to do, of course, with the Pearl Harbor and the tragic circumstances of World War II. In the first place, I think as we look around, there seems to be among Western peoples generally very little understanding of how to approach the problem of war. The West has always more or less accepted war as something that was going to happen whenever ambitious nations or ambitious leaders uh, get into involvements. Actually, however, there has to be something about it that uh, is a little bigger than this. There has to be some way in which war not only can be explained, but can also be eliminated. And I think the only answer we have for that at the present moment is to turn toward the East, where this problem has been given much more consideration than in Europe or America. In the Orient, there are two great structures of belief relating to war. The one is Hindu and is settled in the great Mahabharata cycle. It is a great epic, like the epics of Homer, dealing with the war of brothers, the wars that rose in ambitions and in all the confusions of hasty judgments selfishness, ambition, avarice, and cruelty. And in this particular great work, uh, the Mahabharata, there is a little section that has been called uh, the soul, the Eastern uh, equivalent to the Western Book of Psalms. Uh, this is called the Bhagavad Gita. And this is the Lord's Song. And the background of it is rather interesting to our point of the, of the morning. Prince Arjuna, the head of a great clan in India, is seated in his war chariot on the battlefield of Karachitra. He is faced by an army drawn up against his army. And as he looks across, he sees his own kinsmen. He sees relatives and friends of years standing, waiting to die in battle. And uh, Arjuna is, is desolated by this situation. He is uh, required by the people of his own group to defend them. He does not want to go out and kill anybody. He wants a peaceful solution to everything. Yet he must either surrender his country, destroy his culture, and, in, and enslave his people, or else he has to go forth and fight on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. And as he is in prayer, in meditation in his war chariot, before he gives the war orders, a great light suddenly surrounds the chariot. And in this light, the god Krishna appears. And he takes the place of the charioteer. He sits in the chariot with the prince and recites to him the marvelous story of the Bhagavad Gita. He tells the young prince not to, not to grieve, not to fear, and not to worry. For there's a greatness, a wholeness, and a goodness that encircles everything, no matter how terrible it may appear. And he says, do not fear, because you're not, you cannot kill anyone. No one can kill anyone. No one can prevent death, but no one fails to survive it. On this occasion, there is a great struggle, a great conflict. But always remember that certain is death for the living, and certain is birth for the dead. It is all part of the great story of human growth. Growth through struggle and through pain, 
individual learning to become kind because they have hurt a great deal. Families that suddenly become aware of family when one is taken away from them. All through this struggle, war is a symbol of the negative aspects of human character, a symbol of the pain and sorrow that comes from the abuse of power, from the misuse of leadership. But all these things must, in the end, end in peace. And I think in this particular incident, we are very close to our modern position. We are in a world now, a large part of which is already at war. The dogs of war have been loosed upon the land. Cruelties and abominations are taking place in many parts of the earth. And over it all hangs the supreme symbol of self-destruction, nuclear weapons. How does it happen that a people get into this situation? How does it come about that aggressive leaders, dictators, tyrants, are able to lead their people to self-destruction? The only answer is that people do not understand, do not know, do not have the courage or the position and power to prevent these catastrophes. But uh, Krishna points out in this poem, this great religious poem, that everyone who is alive today, or nearly everyone, will have finished their life here by the end of a hundred years. In a hundred years, natural causes take, take away everything. In a hundred years, this whole pattern is changed, but there is still a pattern. But what happens to those who have disappeared? What happens to those who are no longer with us? Have they ceased? Are they really get, gone? Are they really dead? Western materialism is not very helpful in this particular situation. But the quiet soul in meditation begins to think about these things. And it suddenly comes to our minds that there must be a bigger pattern in which these things come to be more righteously adjusted. We must come to realize the fact that some will last here longer than others, but those who live and those who do not live must both pass through pain. Some feel that the battlefield is a terrible place, and it is. But the battlefield in peace is also a terrible place. The battle of ambitions, of competition, the battle of capitalism versus socialism, the great battles of faith, the magnificent struggle of the human being, all this is part of a strange pattern. In World War II, I remember there were two young men I knew. One uh, was drafted. The other was not because he was one year underage. The one that was drafted died in the battle. The one who stayed home was killed in an auto accident. So you have the same outcome, but from different causes. We have to get back to some values, some pattern, some reason, some purpose, which makes these things part of a divine plan. If we cannot do this, we cannot face them. Therefore, we must realize, as Krishna said, that certain is death for the living and certain is birth for the dead. And out of all of this comes a recognition of one of the great laws of Indian thinking, and that is the law of reincarnation. We must realize that we live in a universe in which everything is alive forever that appearances change, that things seem to go away and some seem to come back. The little child opens its eyes into this world and the aged person goes to sleep at the end of a long and busy life. But these things are incidents in the unfoldment of eternal powers, principles, and lives. The individual who comes into this world was not new when he came. The one who leaves here does not vanish forever and disappear. 
simply because he drops a body that is too old and too tired. As a man casteth off worn out garments and taketh others that are new, so the Spirit casteth off worn out bodies and taketh others that are new. Never the Spirit was born. The Spirit shall cease to be never. Birth and death they are dreams. Life is forever. This is the song of the Bhagavad Gita. And we have to recognize in moments of emergency that it is the, the power that gives us the courage and the patience to face the difficult realities of life. That we create these realities because we are not strong enough yet to prevent them. But consider the present situation. We are all today gravely anxious, anxious over the world situation. We know that a nuclear holocaust would end all the dreams of the ages. We know all these things perfectly well. We want to do everything we can to prevent these things from happening. And one of these days, we shall become tired of killing ourselves and each other. The light will dawn, and there will come into our lives, into our consciousness, the realization of the dignity of life, the reality of it, the importance of it, and the, that we are here to protect it and further it and advance it in every way and not to destroy it. So the Indian classic gives us a certain sense of the fact that we are all passing through lessons. Uh, I see that our speaker today chose to su suggest the idea that the entire the problem of human life is part of the great mystery system of initiation, of the great pattern of processes, of tests, of trials, and that all the initiation rites of antiquity had within them problems of trial, dangers and hazards that could only be surmounted by the individual who had achieved in his heart a final and perfect union with truth. The individual who really understands life is indestructible. Bodies may come and go, but life is eternal if within ourselves we have come to this realization. And here in the West we need a little more of the dimension of future than we've had up to the present time. We have had many hundreds of wars in Europe and America. We will probably have some more, God forbid. But then in all of these changes, we have failed to work in a system of understanding of man's place in things. We have failed to take into consideration the probability, at least, that the divine plan that put us here does not intend to wipe us out. That whatever it is that we come with into this life, something is going to go on. Something is going to build upon sacrifice upon heroism, upon patriotism, upon dedications of all kinds. The dedicated parent has one emergency after another, but there is a reason, there is a reward, there is a purpose, and there is a great good that justifies these struggles that we go through. So it seems very necessary, therefore, to understand more of the circle of life and death in order that we can adjust our consciousness to the inevitables. We all know these inevitables, uh, but we realize so little about them and what they mean to us. Therefore, it is, I think, suitable and proper to, to bear in mind that we have to have a life concept that is big enough. Now, what happens to our life concept? Well, the fashionable mechanistic theory, the materialism which we regard as it's beautifully intelligent, says so there's nothing. It simply wipes the individual out generation after generation. The only immortality is the statue in the public park. All the rest is gone. There is nothing goes that goes on except perhaps a contribution to the future. Perhaps the scientist discovers a cure for some ailment or some commodity to help us improve society. And for these, he is remembered, but he is gone. 
And according to this idea, uh, the entire end of all things is oblivion. Nothing survives. And the only immortality that we have is through progeny. Those who come after us with our blood live something of our lives. They do not know it. We have no reason to suspect that we will know it either. So this is the type of world in which great advancements in material prospects have developed in the last 200 years. These, this is the world in which we have built a terrific economic empire, which we go about expanding, a great industrialism, a great uh, labor process, tremendous political press procedures, the uh, miseries of the stock exchange and high finance. All of these things seemingly are rooted in a condition that exists here. We may make a billion dollars, but we can take none of it with us. Not only we can't take any of it with us, we are not going anywhere with or without it, according to the prevailing thought. So we're going to leave this wealth to our descendants, who will probably kill themselves on dissipation with our funds. All of this is what we call life. While we call this life, we are dead, even while we are still alive. Nothing is meaningful, nothing is pers uh, personal, nothing is real. If the curtain goes down and there is not any of us anymore, we simply become part of an undercurrent of earth or air in which other lives will grow, which seems to be a rather pitiful end to the struggle for existence through which we pass. Socrates faced this in his last days when he chose to be executed by the people of Athens rather than to compromise his principles. So with his disciples grieving about him, they all, of course, were very unhappy, very miserable. But uh, Socrates said, don't worry about me. Nothing is going to go wrong. He said, all my life, I want to know the answers. I wanted to know more about this world than I can ever see from here. So he said, I have a, a conclusion. To one of two things is going to happen when I leave here. The first thing that could happen is that there is the end of Socrates. There is nothing more. If that is so, it's going to be a very peaceful oblivion. I'm not going to worry about anything. I have no enemies. I have no problems. I simply am not. The other answer is more interesting, because if I do survive death, I will then be in the presence of the answers to everything that has worried me in this world. If I survive, then I will live where there are answers to questions, where I will understand something more of the divine plan for things, will have a fuller nature and a study of natural law. Either I will vanish utterly, or I will survive to find the answers of questions that I could never find in the mortal world. And he took the poison and died. Well, this is something that we are facing with, faced with again, on the assumption that we are not quite willing to admit that we begin with a bit of protoplasm and end with a pinch of ashes, that there's something else. We can say this, all right, supposing after death we do live. Suppose we live in a kind of mysterious world that we know very little about, a, a summer land of spirits, that we go somewhere into the universe, and there we continue to be, and we continue perhaps even to share with our friends and relatives who have gone before. In some cases, God forbid. But for some cases at least, we would like it that way. We go to some summer land, like the Elysian fields of the Egyptians. You know, on there, the uh, farmer uh, in the mysterious superphysical fields with his oxen plows as he did along the banks of the Nile while he was alive. Life is just a continuance in a gray mystery land, which according to rewards and punishments will go on. No punishment, however, is eternal. 
the, the individual lives what he has lived here. He may be uh, not even aware, that actually, that he is dead. But he is living in a world of internal realities, which perhaps is more important than anything else. Now, there's another possibility in this, namely, that when he leaves here, he goes to punishment or reward. And this has been made a strong point in various theologies. In the Egyptian rituals of the dead, the negative confession of faith is so important that as one great Egyptologist said that the spirit standing waiting judgment in the hall of the twin truths has to make a statement that not one person alive today could make honestly. The, end of it, the soul has to proclaim its integrities and the jurors sit and listen. Not a lie, not an exaggeration is possible. It must be absolute truth. And the spirit speaking asks for salvation on the grounds that it has forever in its mortal body served the lonely and the miserable has shared its goods with all in need, has never taken anything that did not belong to it, has never it's borne ill witness against any other living person, that has never failed to keep its promise and its word, has never charged usurious interests, has never exploited the needs of others, has never at any time failed to serve those in need, to care for the forgotten and the lonely, to work every day for the common good, and think only, not of itself, but of the world in which it lives and its needs. You can imagine a hundred, a hundred such statements as that being made honestly by a person today who is facing the afterlife. But that was also part of the disciplines of the mysteries and the systems of antiquity which prepared the individual to be a servant of all. So in these uh, particular points, we also then come to the punishment and rewards. Now, in uh, theology, it is rather clear, but the theological explanation is not as well received as it used to be. We are no longer quite concerned with the idea of eternal perdition. We do not feel that a human being, imperfect and incomplete, unfinished already, should go into an eternity of consequences as a result of its actions in this world. We are not supposed to assume that small causes produce great effects. And it is not right to assume that an ignorant person making mistakes, even committing sins, must be punished forever for this, so that the concept, concept of heaven and hell in the theological thinking is no longer very attractive or very rational or very reasonable. It does nothing to strengthen the individual here. One does not become a good because he fears evil. He is good because he performs as well as he can. So the theory of going on to heaven or hell is not particularly acceptable anymore. It doesn't seem to solve a problem. Why should we go to hell when we're in it here? Plato said men do not go to hell where they die. They come to hell when they're born. This is purgatory. This is the place where individuals must grow, must stand strong and firm, and must pass the tests of mortal life to ensure that they are fulfilling the evolutionary processes of the system of cos cosmic way worlds to which we belong. So having eliminated these, there doesn't seem to be too much left. But there seems to be the one thing left that is important, and that is the concept of rebirth. At the present time, probably a third or a half of the world believes and accepts it already. And a, t a poll taken not long ago in Western countries pointed out that those, the numbers that believe in reincarnation have multiplied several fold in the last 25 years. 
it seems to be the only answer that does not in some way uh, force an unfortunate or unreasonable condition. It is certainly preferable to oblivion. And the individual who believes in oblivion may do so. But whatever he believes in, what is real will happen. Now, if we accept the doctrine of rebirth or reincarnation, then we realize what we are in. We're in school. We're in school to learn lessons. And all we have to do to understand this more clearly is to consider the present state of the educational system. At the moment, thousands of people are indignant against education as it is today. They don't believe in it. They don't want it. They want something better. They do not want to graduate their young people from a school that allows them to have drugs or does not guard their morality and gives them no ethical culture. So what is this? It really not only a statement of the school, it is a statement of society and reminds us that our society, the world in which we live, is the great school. As one of the Rosicrucian authors said long ago, we are all ABC Darians in the school of the Holy Spirit. This is a school. This is a school in which various things happen, in various spans between birth and death. But every good deed lives, and every bad deed feeds away. Actually, the marvelous thing is that good works with good wherever you find it. Evil fights evil wherever it appears. One thing or another always happens, but that which builds together is right and helps to make things possible. We, go, we must outgrow the problems that now beset us. We can't walk out on them. Peace cannot be legislated while envy and cupidity are in the human heart and conduct. There is no way we can solve the problem of the world dilemma unless we solve in ourselves the weaknesses which cause us to compromise principle. Practically everything we need to consider at the present time, factually, is the Sermon on the Mount and the words of Jesus at the Last Supper. There is the code. There is what we have to learn. And until we learn it, we have to be punished. But this punishment is not eternal damnation. This punishment is not war upon war forever. This punishment is not the continual victory of evil over good or weakness over strength. Because each of these reverses forces us to a greater determination to correct our own mistakes. We have to face them. And in the little problems of daily living, the alcoholic has to face his own weaknesses. Everything that goes wrong has got to be straightened out by those who cause it. And as no individual is uh, probably willing to make so supreme an effort quickly, it may, may take several lifetimes for the individual to get along working with himself until he solves his own need. It may take 50 lives for an individual to reach a point where he knows what's wrong with war and he knows his part in causing it. When that happens, peace comes. But in nature, nature does not humor. Nature strengthens by forcing resolution. Nature makes us grow. And if there was any way of avoiding it, we would. We've been trying to evade realities since the beginning of history but we've never avoided one of them yet. They come back again and again until the individual outgrows his own weakness. When this happens, civilization outgrows war. And this is the thing we have to work with. Now, another interesting phase of this problem was presented to us in the Dialogues and Discourses of Buddha. Among these discourses, there's the story of the great general who was converted to Buddhism. And, of course, Buddhism was a philosophy of the harmless life. And one day this great general came and asked Buddha the great questions. He said, Master, I am the generalissimo of the armies of the kingdom. I have sworn to support the ruler 
and to support the people and to protect the land. Now, if this calls, this calls for war, what do I do? You tell me war is wrong. You tell me I sh there should be no war. Yet I am sworn to protect my country if an enemy evades it, invades it. What should I do? And Buddha thought very quietly, said, defend your country. But he said, Master, this is different from what you said. Buddha said, no, it isn't. You haven't asked me what it's going to cost you to keep your word. If you are prepared as a true patriot uh, to defend your country, and your country is therefore led by you into war, don't forget that you share the karma of war. You are going to have to pay, not only in the, here in the material world, but elsewhere, for the karma of killing. There's no avoiding. But if it is in a cause that you consider greater than yourself, it is no worse than dying on a battlefield for the same reason. You are going to have to experience and accept the punishment for having to do wrong. You have voluntarily said you would do it. Now, regardless of anything, you were the leader. And all those who perished under your leadership have their own destiny to fulfill. But there is not one of them that carries the destiny that you do. The person who leads the army or leads the nation to war carries the heavy burden of it and must pay that debt. Those otherwise go to sleep and wake again. But there is not one person who will ever die in your army who is dead. Not one who will ever cease to be any more than if there had been peace. And in a few years later, this individual died from natural causes. But the, the native who dies for his principles has a good karma also. The hero who serves, who loves, who, who gives every last moment of life and devotion does not go down to silence, does not go down to darkness, does not go down to death. Everyone who has done their duty as they believed in their heart that duty to be has grown as they could never grow unless they were tested. Each individual is responsible for the morality of his own action. Unselfishness has a great and glorious reward. We can't see it, but the person who has it will know it. And all the way along through these experiences, we are learning the lessons of final peace. We are learning, however, that peace begins not between the generals of the armies, but in our own little family. We have to heal the wounds of strife in our own families, brother against brother, parent against child, child against parent. We have to gradually take on the mature responsibilities a world citizenship, world leadership, world integrities. There is no reason why any individual should believe for a moment that he is sacrificed for any good cause is lost, or that the cause, even if it is lost, affects him. And we are celebrating uh, Pearl Harbor Day, but a lot of fine young people died for their country, died unexpectedly and suddenly. How are we going to evaluate this? Are we going to assume that they are all lying in little rows of white crosses? Are we to assume that they've gone from here to nowhere, that for them all is over and all the blessings of life and all the curses also are no longer for them? And there are some who are still lingering in pain. Are we to understand that all of this is something that cannot be helped? 
or is each war a reminder, a tremendous tragic evidence of the failure of peace and what it means. And here within a few years, comparatively, 30, 40 years, since World War II, more wars, more pillage, more dictators striving to control human hearts, a continuation of the great strife, the strife which is the cause of it all. Strife, impatience, aggressiveness, determination to control or destroy, the building up of egos, gold braid, all these things, and a constant fear hanging over. Actually, today, we are in the presence of the greatest test that we have ever faced concerning survival. A survival which depends be basically upon accepting the challenge of this great nuclear enemy that hangs over us. We know now that the something is going to happen and we can't win. We suddenly realize that we are an alcoholic and we are on the verge of delirium tremens. That we are a narcotic addict who has had all the highs we could have and now is going into the eternal low. We have to realize that all these thousands of years we have temporized with problems. We have tried to do what we wanted to do at the expense not only of each other, but in violation of universal law. Today the, the world is largely made up of transgressors of one size or another. Many of these can't do much about it. But there is no one that can't do something about it. And the beginning of that something is to take a completely new position inside yourself as to what is value and try to live according to a better standard of life. In the last 65 years in which I've been working in these problems, hundreds, perhaps thousands, have brought their problems to me. Most of these problems involve a kind of spiritual ignorance, the inability to understand the reason for things, a bewilderment, but not an understanding and not a sense of essential value. These people have brought their problems, and all these problems have come to stand for ignorance, superstition, or fear. We are ignorant. If, how can we be a great civilized people and remain morally ignorant? How can we claim to be an educated people when we cannot control our own lives? How does it happen that we can think of success in the terms of income and pay no attention to the tragedy that this success is causing? We are faced with a greater and greater stress the population of the earth is increasing. In, uh, in the years that lie ahead, maybe the next hundred years, we cannot continue the, the system of constant uh, financing of things. We cannot build upon natural resources that are becoming more and more depleted. How does it happen that a civilized, educated people can go on creating nuclear waste, doing all these things with a good spirit or trying to find some place to bury it without realizing that 50 years from now someone may have to build a house on that place and will die from the waste. How do we go from day to day with this type of thinking? It is because for some unknown reason, which isn't really justified, we have carefully ignored the wisdom that we have inherited from the natural past. We have ignored the words and thoughts of the great world teachers. We quote them, but we do not live them. We quote Plato when he tells us that any form of government is good if the governor is good, and no form of government is good if the, government is, the governor is bad. And there's no way of compromising this. But we don't pay much attention to it. We also learn that in this world, 
there is not a sufficient supply of anything to permit everyone to be rich. As long as this remains unsolved, we're going to have confusion, crime, rebellion. Because we are not cooperating in the use of what we have, but striving desperately to get hold of a little more at someone else's expense. All these things lead to trouble. And in the presence of the great trouble that is gathering now, we are going to be called upon to solve these problems ourselves. How do we solve them? We solve them perhaps in the terms that each one of us has within his own nature a teacher. There is something we call the soul. There is a guidance from within, a guidance that seems to have come to us with that spark of divine life by which we are able to live. And the spark of life in us, the God in us, is also the great teacher. If we can gradually come to terms with our own inner lives, if we can discover the Sermon on the Mount as it is repeated in our own hearts, and it is every day, and accept it, if we can learn to keep the Ten Commandments joyously, we can do tremendous things. Now, some of these things might and will require sacrifice. We may not have to go out again for another Pearl Harbor, but we might. But whatever it is, we must either start living according to the rules of the game, or else we're going to be in trouble until we bankrupt the whole thing. And I think in this term of Pearl Harbor, this day, we kind of owe it to those who died without fully understanding, leaving behind everything they held dear and cherished. Let us try, as Lincoln said at Gettysburg, that to prove that these shall not die in vain, that we're not just going to wait until another call comes and we'll all rush to the flag and it'll all go over again. Let us really try to do something to, to help these situations. Let's start trying to create in education something that fits young people for a better life than merely computerization. Let us recognize that education is helping a person to live, not teaching him simply to make a career. That we must build careers around integrity so they will contribute to the common menace. We have to do things better, and education is supposed to help us to do this. Education is supposed to make an individual safe, safe for himself and safe for those around him. Instead of that, he is unsafe and he is a menace to everyone else. We must finally put the soul and spirit of truth into our affairs. The soul must govern government must control and direct the works that we are doing every day. There has to be beauty. There has to be love. There has to be faith. We cannot com continually pollute our world with the selfishness and negation. Consider the entertainment field. Consider the arts, the sciences. All these different levels of human aspiration nearly all of them corrupted for physical gain, the commercializing of existence. You can't make it that way. So if we keep on this way, we're going to have more trouble. But there is no reason why we have to remain this way. The voice of the people is the voice of God. And if the individual stands for his principles, tyranny cannot survive. If the individual becomes a friend or other individuals, he's not going to war against them. He is not going to be picked up in this power of conflict, which ends is a very simple fact. All of these paths of glory end but in the grave. created. 
and must sometimes fight through them. The quiet person takes nothing with them but the love that they have had, the thoughtfulness, the kindness, the friendliness that have, that have dominated his conduct and his life. Each person going out of here should be richer than when he comes in, not richer in money, but a better human being. We have anywhere from 50 to 80 or 90, or maybe 100 years of schooling here. And when we leave this school, we should graduate and not be thrown out. We should be graduated into the next class. We should have our own little graduation ceremony with gown and mortarboard hat if necessary. But when we leave here, we should be better human beings than when we came here. And if we kept up that pattern gradually, we would end in a world of peace. We would have more as utopia, in fact, than substance. So if we really believe in the sacrifice these young men of the Pearl Harbor made, they have given us another opportunity, another liberation from tyranny, another incentive to grow. They have sacrificed that we could be better. And there's no reason why we should not be better. Our reward is not firing off guns in their honor. Their reward, their reward and perhaps they know it better than we do, is that we are better human beings and have taken these years of comparative security as means of growing and becoming better people and justifying the sacrifice they have made. It is very important that the true and honorable person does not die in vain. Now we are in the midst of an, an immediate turmoil. We don't know just what to do next. But I think one of the simple things that we are learning, something we never have really understood before, our ancestors worked together because it was their natural tendency. And the opportunities for individual expression were few, but the needs of the many were great. So they, in the village, in the small town, in the community of a hundred years ago, people worked together pretty well. There were very few strangers. Nearly everyone was just a good neighbor. And these situations, in their simplicity, gave us at least a certain amount of stamina, physical health, and freedom from the tremendous emotional and psychic pressures that burden us today. Now it is all different. The individual is born into a strange maelstrom of conflicts. There is no longer any time to help the child to grow. The parents are out trying to be careerists. And as I noticed not long ago, uh, both members of the family got jobs and uh, so they turned to the grandmother to know if she would watch the children for them. She said, be glad to do so for $5 an hour. <laughs> now, this is what's happening, and this just should not happen. We should, for the sake of those who died at Gettysburg, those who died in Europe in World War I, those who died in World War II, to save a free world. This free world is therefore privileged to use these years as a means of growing and deserving freedom. Freedom is something that you can't have if you're in slavery to your own weaknesses. So these years of opportunity and privilege, this nation founded on sacrifice, this nation that has fought its way to a place to which millions of troubled and privated people have come. A world here that is more or less represented by the Statue of Liberty in the harbor. A world of privilege and opportunity, the answer to prayer. William Penn bringing his Quakers, trying to find peace, trying to find right to worship. When we are try now taking the right to worship, is that privilege to not worship anything. This all is a mistake. 
the, the powers that be gave us all a beautiful garden in which we could build a world. And it's going to continue to be as it is until we grow up. Humanity is a kind of adolescent, a bit of an adolescent delinquent at the moment. And it's got to straighten itself out and do things right. And it's going to have the time to do it if it tries. If it gives up and says, what's the use? There'll be bigger trouble. So that uh, the answer seems to be that we're going to do have to demand more and more upon private persons doing the jobs that need doing. We're already discovering this. We're taking away from federal, from state, and county, and, co and city funds many projects and doing them ourselves. We are beginning to take a serious interest in helping each other. We are beginning to realize that if we work together, we can balance any budget because we will give of ourselves that which is necessary to maintain the economic integrity of a country. But while everything is exploited and polluted, the individual is discouraged. But discouragement is no help either, because regardless of whether we're discouraged or not discouraged, we go out of here with the burden to go on, to do more, and to learn something better. We are all here to learn as long as we live. And learning means to learn how to live, not, le not merely learn how to pay bills, but to learn how to have a real life. We're here to grow by learning every day values that help us to become better people and help other people to unfold their potentials. There's a story of an old Greek scholar who was lying in the back room of his little house and uh, he was on his deathbed. And the relatives and friends were grouped in the front room waiting to perform the last services for him. And they got into the usual problem. They began gossiping about the neighbors. They talked about politics. They talked about the sports. They talked about everything while they were just waiting for this old gentleman to pass on. Finally, someone looked into the room and saw him sitting up halfway in bed with his hand clapped behind his ear like this. And one of them said, but grandfather, what are you doing? You, you're not interested in these things anymore. You're about to leave us. And the old gentleman said, yes, I, I'm about to leave you. But as long as I'm here, I can still learn something. <laughs> now, this is what we all have to do. We all have to start learning things. Learning to be better friends, learning to do nicer and more kindly deeds, learning to turn in a full day's work if we're paid for it, learning to make proper use, and also not tempting ourselves and each other into expenditures and extravagances which endanger the future of the system. We are just living in a kind of a whirlwind of quick profits, actually as though this was the last chance and that we have to make it now or not at all. This isn't the last chance. The chances go on until we make it right. And uh, I think if we could visualize ourselves as a great wave of life moving through space, moving in and out of material existence, on the one hand coming in to face the unknown, on the other hand going out to face the unknown, here a little while, but alive, conscious beings forever. And that little by little, we must transform this material world into an enlightened system of education. It is a kind of alchemical laboratory where we must learn the secrets of the universal medicine and also of the universal truths of existence. It is here that religion must come of age and must become the leader of the important changes that must come in human character. Here faiths have to realize that while there are 72 names of God, there is only one God. And all this fighting over the uh, deities and all the religious confusion that we have is essentially an ulterior motive problem. The religion is being used as a means of assisting dictators to control ignorant people. This is no good either. 
But religion as it should be is the, an essential part of the civilizing of the human being. We must come back to the fundamental values of life. What do we need to know? We need to know that which is necessary for health. We know to know what is necessary to honest labor what is necessary to know for our children, and how to, ma to maintain our own domestic relationships and not land on the, in the divorce courts all the time. All these weaknesses are strange things because, as even a doctor can tell you, the human body even is an amazing thing, an unbelievable mystery. The functions of man are incredible. The potentials, potentials are inevitable. Here we are, the most remarkable creature that nature has ever produced, and we can't even get along with each other. We can't use what we have for anything except making trouble. The time has definitely come when this body, this mind, these emotions must be brought into harmony to the production of what you might call a normal person. The, we are satisfied to be average when we should be normal. We should be using all these potentials more and more to enlarge and, and, and develop the potentials of life. You see the great artists, Albert Dürer, Michelangelo, Leonardo, the tremendous genius in these people. There is the genius of the great violinist. There is the genius of the great inventor. All of these things are releases from within the individual. The power of the human being is unlimited if he knows how to use it. And that power was given to him for one purpose only. It was not that he might become a conqueror of others, but that he might stand with others to conquer the ignorance which stands between us all and the better world we want to live in. We have all these powers, but we don't have the strength to use them. And each person is so concerned with his own little heap and with the own little ideas that we can't work together. We need today a religion which is largely personal, but which is compatible with the religion of every other living creature that has a decent faith. That we can meet, mingle without question with those of almost any persuasion, any form of education, with all nationalities and racial groups, we can do it all in peace. They are all part of a plan. We didn't create them, and they are here for us to work with and to work side by side with everything that is necessary to make a greater peace. Now, we've got a good many crosses out there in the Pearl Harbor, and we're in danger of more. Other nations are dying by the tens of thousands to uh, placate dictatorships and tyrannies. Everywhere, mortal mortality is destroying itself. Everywhere, the young and the old, the child dying of malnutrition, all these things are unbelievable catastrophes, but they only exist because we do not understand what life is. We think that life is simply getting at everybody a square inch of land, or getting into a certain political group, or advancing a social ideology. This is not it. Life is a thing of for survival of itself in the most comfortable and pleasant and human, humane way possible. Until we get over these other things, all those who have given their lives for us have given them in vain. Now let's therefore, instead of thinking, them, uh, thinking of them as heroes in a graveyard, let us think of them as memories in ourselves of those who did give the full measure of their devotion, that they have died that we may live, or live better, or escape slavery, or escape tyranny. They have been a first line of defense for the integrities of a free people. But there's not much use 
in defending the integrities if they are not there. We have responsibility to those who died for us. We have responsibility for those who live for us. And we have responsibility for those coming after who must mend or prepare what we have left unfinished. We have a very serious and definite job to do. We have to be true to the, to the right or else all that we really respect is betrayed. We, we should be right because Jesus gave us the dream of a universal brotherhood. We should remember the wisdom of, Soc of Socrates, the deep understanding of Confucius, when he said the strength of the empire depends upon the strength of the home. Civilization is a gradual expansion of home. Lao Tzu taught us that it, we should sit sometimes on the side of a hill and look out over the landscape and realize what a beautiful world we have. And then we should look into ourselves and see if we're worthy of it. And when we do, we're apt to be a little disappointed. We also have Buddha, the light of Asia, who gave the message of purifying the mind, performing the good, and serving truth. We know these people were very great in their own way. Zoroaster, who died with the assassin spear in his back because he taught the brotherhood of man. Plato, Aristotle, Pythagoras, all these great teachers have given us a heritage. In the Middle Ages, many of them died martyrs to the search for truth. We have received a wonderful heritage of good and also a very nasty heritage of hate. Now, it's our privilege to decide which of the heritage patterns we're going to follow. We can be inspired by the good to something better, or we can relapse into the bad because it's a little easier and seemingly a little bit more financially profitable. We have to make decisions in the name of those who have lived and died for us. We have, we have the knowledge. There's no way of denying the fact that we know better than we do. We know what it means to love one another. We know what it means to keep the faith and keep the truth. We know that only as, when, as individuals we do these things that nations become great and nations become good. We are all of us part of one little pattern of dedicated life going to school on a little planet in space. We were not created to become masters of each other. We were created to become friends, to be one purpose, to preserve this world in which we live. We can restore it so that it can perpetuate us for an indefinite period of time, or we can destroy it to the degree that it will not sustain the life we know for another century. All of these things are in our hands. And whenever we get in the mood uh, to be grateful for something, we should be grateful to the power that has given us the right and the means to be great, to be good, to be loving, wise, and friendly people. We are, must and should be grateful for wisdom within ourselves, faculties, skills, and abilities by which we can transcend the commonplace, the means within ourselves to solve our own ignorance and to create out of our mistakes a virtue that is going to endure forever. We also have a right to be grateful in all the things that we do uh, for the many daily good things that happen to us. And while we are eternally complaining and eternally wishing for something better, that most people, in this country especially, have a great deal to be thankful for. And if there's things we're not thankful for, we can look them over. And if we find that we have just overlooked something good, we can correct that. And if we find the things we're not grateful for are not good, then it is within ourselves to correct these things. 
We can do anything we want to do if we work together under an inspiration of a proper educational background. Our education today should definitely include the highest aspects of ethics, the highest vision of mysticism and esotericism, and all that is good to help us to meet these problems. We should definitely educate our educators. We've got to civilize our leaders in many respects, and we have to create a condition in which a leader who fails to be right loses his following. When, this, when we simply do not help him, he can't get very far. If he has a wrong cause, it is not just something that we should take it in stride and forget it and try to make ours while the making is good. We must stand with principles or those who have given more than we are asked to give will not achieve the ends that they most desired when they made a great sacrifice. So wherever the young men are, who are whose bodies lie in the military cemetery, let us imagine for a moment that perhaps they are very much alive, and perhaps they are even able to know what we are doing. They know whether we're keeping the game or not. We know why they did what they did. Perhaps some of them had no interest in dying for any cause, but were forced by circumstances to do so. But whatever it is, that great army of those who have given all must watch forever the results of their own sacrifices. Just as parents must sometimes live with the delinquencies of the children they have not properly trained. So we have to live with the consequences of things. And it would be far better for all of us if when that time comes and we change worlds, as we always will, always have, that we go forward with at least the realization that we haven't damaged anything, that we have helped to make things better for someone, that we have tried real hard to do the job that was ours. We haven't tried to do something we couldn't do, but we have st stuck with carefully the thing that we can do. And now there are new opportunities to influence education, new concepts arising in science, new concepts arising all through the world. The great nadir of materialism has passed. We dipped down into materialism when science became the symbol of perfection, when infinite progress was limited to mental achievement. Now we know what's the truth is that this mental advance, this great technological leap that we are supposed to have made, was not the answer. We made the leap and fell on our faces. Now we have to have something else. We have to shift the leadership to that which is and always was the true leader, and that is the divine life within ourselves, the light of God that shines through our eyes the day we're born the light of truth that is around us in the summer and the birds and all the beautiful things of life. We've got to bring them back and make them real in our lives. We've got to have a beautiful world, a world of people who love to grow, a world of people who love to serve each other. And if we can build this back to where it should be, or up to what it must be, we will find this a very pleasant world to live in. And as a byproduct, let's remember, as I think Dr. Randall would probably like to point out, that when these sums are accomplished, there will be a major change in the health patterns of humanity. We will not all be neurotics. We will not all be falling under the despairs and the sorrows of a generation. We will not have nearly as many ulcers. The physical body cannot stand wrong management any more than the world can. And as long as we live with sick attitudes, the world will be sick. But when we finally wake up to the facts of life, as been pointed out already, it is quite possible that we will have very little uh, disease. Disease is from dis-ease. 
And we all have that. But we can get over it. And we can have instead bodies comparatively healthy for a long time. Because we do not destroy them in useless competition or break them up with fears, anxieties, and miseries. There is no reason why, according to some even scientific approaches, that the average person should not be hale and hearty at a hundred years. Maybe even more. There are people who have lived even much more than that. There's a man buried in Westminster Abbey who lived over 150 years. Of course, his advantage was that he lived in the country. And he also lived before progress was really invented. <laughs> After progress is invented, everything has gone wrong. Because it isn't progress. Progress is nothing unless it is motivated by friendship, integrity, and affection. What the world should be doing is more or less falling in love with its own needs. It should find in natural human relationships the fulfillment of things and not depend on all kinds of imaginary escapes and defenses in order to be endurable. Most of the immorality and decadence of our time is due to the confusion, the loss and lack of natural things, and the definite, to, the definite effort to forget realities in some kind of escape mechanisms of which TV might be a good model. Uh, these things, imagine spending the rest of our lives watching artificial dramas made on TV, uh, largely for the purpose of paying the bills of uh, the actors and so forth, and to provide young delinquents growing up with new ideas for some advanced delinquencies. This is the way we are doing it. It is all so foolish, it's so crazy, it's so unbelievable that a, that a generation of people, a human family, that has been millions of years building, that has gone through so much, should suddenly begin, become incapable of uh, vestigial common sense. We need it. We've got to start. And it always has to start with us. So every person who does a little better each day is contributing to the survival of human society. The individual who doesn't care and makes a new mistake every day is just gradually destroying our natural resources and destroying himself. So the psychology of the matter is that you can't have a sick world and healthy people. Therefore, the time has come to create individual health by working together to create a world in which health is possible. As the healthy world will support healthy people and vice versa. But while we live in constant anxiety and fear, the only people who really succeed in achieving something really out of our misery are the physicians. They are the ones who we need because we are breaking the rules. So in the, at this time, let's see, before we have to have another Pearl Harbor, that we can make it unnecessary. That when the time comes, we'll stand together for things that are right. And in standing together for these right things, uh, we can be true to the millions who have died to give us hope. Whole civilizations have wiped, been wiped out trying to be true to principles and truths. One time after another, ulterior motives have taken over. We see the Crusades, where for over 300 years, Europe became practically depopulated. We find the wars between the religions, we find the fight that is now being done between the various religions of Asia. All of these things in the name of truth, and every one of them a monument to falsehood. There is no need for these things. There is no need for anything of this kind. Consider the Muslim situation for just a second. What do we find in the Koran on that? Muhammad says, No one who does not believe that Jesus of Nazareth was a true prophet of the Lord can go to heaven. That's not what we get now. What we get now is the teaching of the victorious caliphate. Those who came after exploited the prophets, 
The law is not proven that, Mo, that Muhammad ever carried a sword in his life. But now comes the victorious ones. Now comes the ones who are building great temporal empires upon the abuse of their spiritual convictions. All of these things happen every day. It's time to stop having them happen. If we can stop these things and put the faiths themselves back in their relationship to each other, which they were intended to have, we'll have religious unity. And if we can get the religions together, it will be a large part of the reforming of human society. So let each of us take a little job, do what we can, work on it a bit, and see if we can't do something every day as in memory of those who have died for us and in the hope for those who will be born from us to better times that lie ahead. Well, I guess that's it for the morning. I'd like to mention, however, that the exhibition at the uh, Los Angeles County Museum, the new building is just opening, uh, is now open. It will go from here to Chicago and from Chicago to The Hague, and that we are well represented there with documents, manuscripts, books, and printed works dealing with their subject, the subject of mysticism. And don't forget that it's not quite traditional that the county museum should feature mysticism. It seems to be telling us something. It's telling us the changes are coming. And we think you'll be interested in going and see that exhibition in the new building that was built for its exp uh, expression. It is a very beautiful exhibit. And it has a great deal of substance to it. We have subscribed the material dealing with the Rosicrucians, with the alchemists, with the mystics and transcendentalists, and our various factors are beautifully displayed. And in the catalog, the major catalog that is issued, are there are many, many of our items are photographed and shown. So I guess it probably looks like there might be 50 or 60 of them in the catalog alone. So they are interested. Now, these things point out something. If 25 years ago, no one would have had the slightest indication of such an idea. But times change. And the wonderful thing is that times can change for the better. So we hope to see you when you can again.